In today's video, I break down how I raised $10 million for my company Verti and share our pitch deck and investment process to help you do the same. Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name's Alex, and on this channel, we focus on human performance to help you live healthier, wealthier, happier, and more productive lives. When I set out to raise our $10 million Series A investment round at Verti, there were a few examples of how to compose an investment deck for a deep technology company, and there were minimal explanations of how to efficiently run an investment process, and certainly little guidance for doing so during a global pandemic when in-person meetings just weren't possible. Our Series A closed pretty quickly, and I was asked about our investment process by a number of tech journalists and peers. And so in the spirit of knowledge sharing and transparency, I thought I'd go into detail regarding the process where I came at it with minimal example materials or stepwise guides. Hopefully this video will help you to raise your own Series A round, save you time and help get you back to the most important thing, building an amazing product and mission led business. In today's video, we're gonna cover how I decided when to raise a Series A investment, the preparation I did, we're gonna look at the pitch deck and materials, the process itself, and finally, what I learned. If you head over to the blog, you can even access the actual pitch deck and materials I use for the Verti Series A for free. So let's get into it. In September of 2020, Verti had grown by almost 1,000% in revenue with low churn and an aggressive product roadmap. On the back of some press, where we were featured on the NASDAQ tower in Times Square, a number of venture capital firms began to reach out to us. At the same time, I was feeling pretty good about company growth and while our financial model had a Series A raise penciled in for summer 2021, we had already exceeded all of our goals set at our seed round and I felt the time was right to accelerate development and bring in some senior personnel where I, as a solo founder, had been wearing lots of hats across the business. I discussed the plan with our seed investors, board and advisors, and everyone agreed it was a great time to raise using the end of the year as a hard close for meetings and the first three months of 2021 to wrap due diligence and legals. To summarize, the three criteria I used to decide on when to raise were, firstly, the business growth and revenue, secondly, whether we had met or exceeded our target set at our seed round, and thirdly, the need for additional resources to grow even faster. In terms of revenue, I was more interested in growth rather than actual number. When researching average revenues of Series A companies, data from Y Combinator notes that these can vary widely. We've seen Series A's happen for SaaS companies with annual recurring revenue between $200,000 and $9 million, with plenty of companies falling all along that range. Clearly, VCs don't care that much about this rule. At the time of raising our Series A, we had 14 employees, and I wanted to run a process which got me back to working on the business rather than spending too long raising capital. 21 days after starting the process, we had five term sheets, which was fairly crazy, and meant we then had to think about which investors to choose from, putting us in a position of abundance. So let's dive into what I did to get there. I tend to make decisions and manage any project using a simple system of research, plan, execute, and iterate, all based on data. I spent a solid week preparing for raising our Series A, so after deciding to raise capital, I first discussed with the team and stepped out of my day-to-day -day duties to concentrate fully on fundraising. Fundraising itself can be all-encompassing and take anywhere from two weeks to four months. For early-stage companies, raising money is the job of the CEO, and I planned for it to be my sole full-time focus. I prepped the team for life without me, set up regular check-ins, and ensured we had a robust hiring plan for when the funding round closed. Now, as a surgeon, I'm very comfortable talking about metrics, numbers, and practicalities, but was less good at blue ocean storytelling. I therefore spent most of my prep time working on the deck, gathering data, making projections, and constantly iterating based on feedback from peers, existing investors, and investors on our updates list who were friendly. We'll touch on the deck shortly, but the best advice I was given was to tell a story of how the business is going to win such that investors will be scared they are missing out. Generating fear of missing out, combined with solid growth metrics, will mean that investors are less likely to pass you up. After creating the pitch deck, I ensured that our data room was robust so that when investors wanted to review it, I could instantly grant access. I iterated upon our seed data room with the latest information pertinent to the company, covering key business information, contracts, legal, financial models, and more. I chose to use DocSend, which allows for spaces to be created, which can be shared with investors via individual secure tracking links. 
Docsend also allows for electronic NDAs to be incorporated and for expiry dates to be set. All this essentially meant that the data room looked nice rather than the simple folder structure, and I could see how interested investors were following access being granted by link tracking. Plus, the contents were secure and access automated to save me time and any concern regarding sharing sensitive information. Finally, I created a mini CRM in an Excel document I made a list of the 100 key investors I wanted to connect with. This was a mix of investors already on our investor updates list, together with investors I would need to approach cold or via warm intro. I then created a schedule for when I would make initial approaches, have coffee meetings, and follow on multi-partner meetings to set myself goals and a time frame to keep the process as tight as possible. To help save time, I also automated follow-up using email templates with links to the pitch deck and data room so that I could send these immediately following a meeting. I'm a huge stickler for being fast and responsive and a key component of this is being prepared. We'll touch on the CRM and playbook when we look at the process itself, but let's first look at the pitch deck and the memo we used. When creating the Series A pitch deck, I tried to follow some key pieces of advice I had been given. Firstly, I kept the Series A deck concise to 15 slides in total. I limited each slide to a single concept. I allowed data to tell a story. I kept concepts simple and left room for deeper conversations and questions. I kept the slides visual and light on text. And I followed a standard format of problem, market size, solution, traction, team, vision, and use of funds. I ended up cutting out lots of information I wanted to put into the deck and prepped a concise pitch to run through in 10 minutes at coffee meetings and a longer pitch using an appendix for questions and second and third stage meetings. I've made the pitch deck itself freely available for you on my blog, so feel free to head over and check it out now. In addition to the deck, I also created a longer written document of three A4 pages, which covered each slide in detail and helped to flesh out what I had spoken about at the pitch. Memos can help with storytelling as they are a longer written document and the memo was seen as helpful by investors and provided supplementary information where the deck was more visual. You can think of this as a mini brochure covering key business information and expanding on your slides. Memos are standalone, can be read without the pitch deck and aligned to the internal memos used by venture capitalists to communicate an investment opportunity. Usually the investor taking your company forward will write a memo laying out the case for the investment. So anything that makes his or her life easier is likely to be well received. I practiced my pitch religiously and I timed myself. I practiced by myself and with anyone who would listen, taking notes on any feedback and pressing people to see if they understood the business and were excited by it. If not, I simplified it, iterated it and repeated it. The main positive feedback from investors on the deck and memo was that the vision was clear and that we had been capital efficient in a short space of time with a small team. The negative feedback was that we could have had more data on marketing and growth channels and more data on opportunities outside of healthcare. One thing I would add to the deck going forward is a summary slide on pages one or two, which summarizes key metrics such as ARR, month on month growth, year on year growth, MPS score, and sales rep payback period to really grab attention upfront as a headlines page. Having created and iterated the Series A materials and set a schedule with my list of well-researched investors, I then followed a set strategy to be as efficient as possible with my time. We already had an investor updates mailing list I had built over a four month period prior to raising. This is actually something I highly recommend doing and it allowed for quick meetings and we'd had investors reaching out to us on the back of some press. In total, this got us around 15 investor meetings upfront. For anyone I didn't have a direct connection to, I looked for warm intros from investee companies in the VC's portfolio I was targeting, from other investors and from lawyers and accountants in our network. This got us to a total of around 30 meetings. I didn't end up using cold outreach and opted for warm intros only. I'd created a template email which anyone introing us could use to make things as easy as possible for them and to reduce any obstacles. And I'd highly recommend you do the same. Rather than pitching to investors one after another, I did my best to run a parallel process where I had as many coffee meetings as possible in weeks one and two. And I then pushed for quick follow-up meetings from investors who were interested and were also a fit for us. While a parallel process is very meeting heavy, for context I was doing around five plus meetings per day on average due to Zoom meetings being more accessible than in-person meetings, a parallel process is also very time efficient, which is what we were optimizing for. At the end of each meeting, I gauged interest and pushed for a follow-up meeting and next steps, ensuring I understood the investor's time frame and their thesis 
to make sure they aligned to our aim. After each meeting, I noted down any questions that were asked and ensured I had solid answers for each should they come up again. I used a standard follow-up template which included a secure docsend link to the deck and memo and some collateral material from the website, including a product video, which I shared immediately after the end of each meeting. After each meeting, I noted down the date in my Excel CRM, the date of the next booked meeting, any keynotes, and if we were rejected, the reason we weren't a fit. Using Docsend, I was able to see when and for how long investors reviewed the investment materials, which helped to gauge interest and to also understand how they operated. Following my own advice on rejection, I didn't let any knockbacks phase me, thanked investors, and continued on with other leads. If investors didn't follow up within 48 hours after the coffee meetings, I emailed over a non-chasing business update to offer value and a friendly reminder and optimize for the investors who responded fast as being fast is part of our company culture. As with any funnel, by weeks two and three, we were down to 20 investors who wanted multi-partner second and third stage meetings. Some investors moved really quickly with days in between meetings and others were slower. As I prepared our data room and had answers ready to go over any questions asked over email, I was able to quickly respond and therefore the best investors could also move as fast as possible. By week three, we were offered our first term sheet and we ended up with five term sheets of various terms and offers. By week four, I was in an unexpected situation of having to select a lead investor. At the beginning of the process, I had some biases about the types of investor I thought I wanted. However, after thinking deeply and reflecting on the investor conversations, the key criteria I felt were important to us were, firstly, the investor had to be passionate about our mission. Secondly, they had to understand our technology. Thirdly, they had to have good communication skills and be founder friendly, both in term sheet terms and their own conversation and attitude. And finally, the investor had to have strong feedback from their own portfolio companies and from the wider investment community. The first three points were apparent from conversations throughout the process and from the term sheets offered. For the fourth point, I opted to do our own due diligence and speak with portfolio companies and other investors. I took my time doing this as a Series A lead investor will likely be on your board and effectively part of your company and team and in your life for a long period of time. On the point of term sheets, my suggestion is to keep things as founder friendly and vanilla as possible and not to over optimize or haggle on specifics beyond the market norm. We were delighted to accept a term sheet from our lead investor, who by the way, was one of the few investors who actually asked us about our company mission and took real interest in the team as people. Following term sheet acceptance, you then move into due diligence and legals. As we had been open with our data room, we had everything prepped and were good to go. And then it was just a matter of handing over to lawyers and signing documentation, which took longer than expected. So what did I learn from this? Well, my main learning points from the process were firstly that fundraising necessitates all of your founder time and consequently expect a dip in productivity if you're in a small company while you focus on fundraising. Secondly, build an investor updates mailing list proactively 12 to six months before you plan to raise investment. This will help you get those first meetings and kick things off strong. Zoom calls are extremely tiring, especially when speaking with people in different time zones. Don't take long meetings at an early stage and set boundaries with your time. Finally, legals and due diligence after accepting a term sheet can be long and expensive and expect that this is part of the process and try to get back to your business as quickly as possible. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out my videos on the reason behind raising venture capital and on hiring and company culture. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future topics you'd like to see covered, please let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you again next time.